Good morning, everyone. I am Rosemary Antoine. Uh, I am joined here today with Commissioner Paolo Vanucci, who is also the person who is in charge of our fairly new unit on economic, social, and cultural rights, which I think is of particular significance um, to this hearing. I imagine I will soon be joined by Commissioner Jose de Jesus. We have simultaneous hearings going on, but I don't want the time to go, so we will start. Uh, welcome to all of you to the State of Canada for coming to this hearing, which has been requested by the Justice and Corporate Accountability Project, JCAP, Halifax Initiative, and Mining Watch Canada, and we welcome all of the petitioners. This is a very important topic for us. Um, and we will give each of you, here we have uh, Commissioner Orozco joining us, uh, 20 minutes, after which we will have a period of discussion, comments, observations by the commissioners, and then we should have a, a, a short amount of time for feedback. We are also joined this morning with the Executive Secretary, Emilio Alvarez. So please, petitioners. First of all, thank you very much, Commissioners, uh, President of the Commission, for accepting this hearing today. We're here to speak to some issues that we've outlined in the report, Human Rights, Indigenous Rights in Canada's Extraterritorial or Obligations that we sent to the Commission from the Canadian Network for Corporate Accountability, which is a coalition of 29 human rights, labour, advocacy, faith-based and social justice organisations from across Canada. You'll find a full list of them on page three of that submission. My name is Jennifer Moore. I'm the Latin America Program Coordinator for Mining Watch Canada, a member of the CNCA. And I'll speak to Canadian government supports to the Canadian mining industry in Latin America and related violations. Shinny Mai from the Justice and Corporate Accountability Project at Osgoode Hall Law School will speak to co corporate social responsibility and the lack of remedy for mining affected communities. Matt Eisenbrandt is the legal director of the Canadian Centre for International Justice, and he'll talk about litigation and attempts at legislative reform in Canada related to the Canadian mining industry abroad. Since the 1990s, the Canadian government has worked to position Canada as a hub of financing and other supports to mining at home and abroad. 75% of the world's mining companies now register in Canada, and some 60% list on Canadian stock exchanges. So this makes Canada not the only, but certainly an influential player in the mining industry in many Latin American and Caribbean countries. We don't have time to discuss the impacts of the mining industry, save to say that it's highly destructive, driven by short-term interests that have a very long-term impact on the social, cultural, environmental, and economic well-being of affected communities. I think you already have heard testimonies and, and seen evidence of this uh, in the complaints submitted uh, regarding Gold Corps Marlin Mine in Guatemala, Barrett Gold's Pascualama Project in Chile, and also the work that was done by the Latin America Working Group on Mining and Human Rights that submitted the report last year and systemized uh, 22 cases regarding mining conflicts in Latin America and the Caribbean, all involving Canadian mining companies. Through its acts and emissions, the Canadian government plays a central role in enabling Canadian mining companies in Latin America and the Caribbean, as well as tolerating and contributing to the systemic rights violations taking place. The Canadian state backs the industry in many ways. Loans and insurance, an extensive range of diplomatic services, the use of overseas development aid to support mining projects and to promote mining code reforms that are favourable to corporate interests and damaging to Indigenous and collective human rights. This is just a short list. I want to tell one story in some detail, talking particularly about Canadian embassies. These are the Canadian government's on-the-ground representatives in the region who have privileged access to what's going on in mining-affected communities and in related policy making. They help us to understand how the Canadian government tolerates and accepts Indigenous and human rights violations in order to enable and defend the mining interest, industry's interests. We gained these insights uh, with some of our partner organizations through an access to information request about the Canadian Embassy in Mexico and Black Fire Exploration in Chiapas that operated a mine for two years before it was shut down. It demonstrates four aspects of the Canadian state relationship with a mining company to enable, 
to troubleshoot conflict, to ignore threats to local activists, and to continually defend company interests. First, we see the embassy enable Blackfire to start up its mine by putting pressure on the state of Chiapas when there was not clear community consent for the mine and the company was facing permitting challenges. We also saw the embassy then troubleshoot for Blackfire when protests grew against the mine about which it had lots of information. We also saw how it ignores threats to local activists. In particular, local leader Mariano Abarca traveled with a delegation to Mexico City and spoke with a Canadian embassy official on film. He stated that the company had broken promises, that its mine was doing environmental damage, and that there were armed workers intimidating him and others opposed to the mine. <laughs> Within a couple of weeks, Mariano Abarca was arrested off the street while he was making preparations for a forum against mining. The embassy knew that Abarca was arrested on the basis of spurious allegations made by the company. Despite this, despite Abarca's te testimony about armed workers and despite 1,400 letters sent to the embassy expressing dire worry for Abarca's life, the embassy's response focused on ensuring the continuity of the company's operation. Six weeks later, Abarca was murdered, the mine was shut down on environmental grounds, and it came to light that the company had been making direct payments into the personal bank account of the local mayor in order to keep down protests. Then we saw the embassy continue to defend the company. The embassy distanced itself, not so much from the company, but rather from the investigation into the murder, refusing to meet with affected groups. Some two months later, it sent a fact-finding delegation to the community and spoke with them. And the report, its report about unfulfilled promises, lack of community support, environmental damage, and corrupt practices was sent to the highest echelons of the Canadian government. Nonetheless, it continued to advise Blackfire about how it could sue the state of Chiapas under the terms of NAFTA um, after, it had, after the mine for having closed the mine. A few years later, when Mariano Abarca's brother and one of his sons took these findings to the Canadian Embassy in Mexico, they heard the same old story, that the Canadian government encourages companies to respect local laws and maintain high standards of corporate social responsibility, when in fact the Embassy's active and unquestioning support may have acted as a disincentive for Blackfire to comply with local and international law. When they asked the Canadian Embassy at a minimum to not ignore threats against other community leaders in Mexico who are being threatened and criminalized, the Embassy said this would be tantamount to intervening in Mexican sovereignty. The Embassy did not think, however, that intervening the, with the state of Chiapas, however, to put Blackfire's mine into operation was intervening in Mexico sovereignty. There are, other likely, there are other such examples, and likely to be many more, since the Canadian government has now made it policy to channel 100% of its diplomatic core to back private interests, something they call economic diplomacy, which given the predominance of Canadian investment in the mining sector, means yet more support to mining companies in the region, despite the increasing risk that defenders run of being demonized, criminalized, threatened, and killed. This is also just one of the ways, through its acts and emissions, that we see the Canadian state supporting Canadian mining companies through thick and thin, when communities and workers bring complaints, and when there are serious questions regarding the legitimacy, the legality, and the compatibility of their operations in this model of mining with the rights in, of Indigenous and non-Indigenous communities. Thank you very much. Thank you. My name Sorry, my name is uh, Shinny Mai from uh, Justice and Corporate Accountability Project. I'm a professor at Osgoode Hall Law School. It's a real honor to be here, to be able to present. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, corporate social responsibility, or CSR, because that's the cornerstone of the Canadian policy with respect to uh, mining companies. I'm going to uh, uh, ask four questions. What is CSR? What does it do? Uh, how does it work? And I'll give you an example of how it works. Uh, and what's the United Nations saying about Canada's reliance on CSR? Uh, CSR is... Sorry. These are uh, voluntary codes of conduct that are supposed to guide companies in how they act. And, and they relate to uh, things like uh, the environment, about workers' rights, uh, human rights, indigenous rights, uh, and you can see a list of them. I've handed them out uh, to you. If you look on the second uh, uh, sheet, uh, commissioners, uh, in a sheet that looks like this, uh, you'll see a list of corporate social responsibility uh, mechanisms. For example, uh, the, um, the first one is equator principles, which applies to banks. And uh, that, that uh, they say that the, the banks won't lend money to some 
uh, projects unless there's free prior informed consent of indigenous people. Uh, we have, if we go further down, the uh, Prospector and Developers Association of Canada. There's, uh, there's quite a, a few of these. Uh, and th through uh, what Canada calls the Building a Canadian Advantage uh, policy, uh, they uh, purport to uh, ask uh, mining companies to live up to these uh, CSR standards. So what good are they? Uh, well, what good are CSR standards? I teach uh, first year law students, and I've got a class that talks about uh, conflicts between indigenous communities and mining companies. And uh, my, uh, so we go through all of these mechanisms, and at the end, uh, they have to write a paper on what the best mechanism is. Uh, the, you know, for the students, like first year law students are very optimistic, they think that, you know, they go to law school because this is where they're going to find a solution. If there's a wrong, there's going to be a legal way to, to solve it. Well, we go through all these mechanisms. If you look at the sheet, look at the very right-hand column of all of these corporate social responsibility mechanisms, you see that not a single one can provide redress to, uh, to somebody that is harmed. So uh, they are shocked and disappointed. It's like having a whole highway system run on an honor system on a voluntary code. And if you get in an accident, you can't sue anybody because there's no legal framework, because it's all voluntary. What does uh, CSR do? Uh, well, the example I have is a corporate social responsibility counselor. Uh, just for a bit of history, in 2005, a, a parliamentary committee uh, looked at Canadian mining, they were very concerned, and they said to Canada that uh, the, the government should enact clear legal norms to ensure that Canadian companies and residents are held accountable for their activities overseas. Clear legal norms. In 2010, the government came back with the uh, Corporate Social Responsibility Councillor to mediate disputes. So if a community or individual had a complaint, they could go to try to mediate a dispute. But the, uh, a person could not make people come to the table, they couldn't make, give any orders, they couldn't find any investigation. Uh, in other words, the whole thing was a voluntary mechanism to enforce voluntary standards. And this is exactly what happened. We saw that uh, she only had six cases before she quit. Um, there were uh, three cases that went away on preliminary grounds. Uh, three cases went, uh, went through the communities thought that they were going to finally get to talk to somebody. The companies withdrew in all three cases, and that was the end of it. So the last point is, what's the United Nations saying about this? Well, the United Nations has been very direct, these treaty bodies, uh, there's four of them, and they've said that Canada needs to have a legislative or administrative measures to prevent acts of Canadian corporations registered in Canada which negatively impact people outside of Canada. 2002, the Special Rapporteur on Toxic Waste said that. 2007, Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination said that. 2012, the Committee on the Elimination of Racial Discrimination came back and said uh, they were disappointed that Canada hadn't followed up on their 2007 recommendation. 2012, the Committee on the Rights of the Child. So uh, what we want to say to the Commission is that you aren't treading on new ground you are uh, 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 going to be addressing an issue that's already well known uh, both internationally and in the communities. Thank you. Good morning, Commissioners. My name is Matt Eisenbrandt. I'm the Legal Director for the Canadian Centre for International Justice. There are no real remedies in Canada for mining affected communities other than those that are possible through civil litigation in Canadian courts. And litigation to this point has not yet resulted in condemnations of any Canadian companies or compensation to those who have been affected. The only legislation that got close to creating regulation in Canada, though not necessarily a remedy, was Bill C-300 a few years ago. C-300 would have conditioned Canadian economic and political support for Canadian mining companies to the company's compliance with human rights and environmental standards. In particular, Canadian embassies would not have been able to promote or support 
mining activities of companies who violated these standards. Bill C-300 was defeated by six votes in Parliament, with all par parliamentarians from the governing Conservative Party voting against it, and key official opposition parliamentarians absent from the vote. As a result, the only way to seek a remedy in Canada is through civil litigation. But only a handful of cases have been brought forward to this point because of major challenges that face uh, affected individuals. In the last five years, there have been a few initial cases, but those have been dismissed at the preliminary stages on jurisdictional grounds before even reaching a full development of the evidence in the case. On two occasions, Canadian courts have ruled that other countries are more appropriate venues than Canada, despite the fact that companies were uh, incorporated in Canada and had ties to Canada. There are currently two active civil lawsuits in Canada, both involving Guatemala and both with very disturbing allegations. There are three consolidated lawsuits against Hud Bay Minerals, two of them dealing with a murder and an attempted murder by the chief of security for Hud Bay, and the other involving rapes of several women during a forced eviction by Hud Bay's security personnel. This is the first Canadian case that has surpassed these initial jurisdictional hurdles, and that's primarily because Hud Bay dropped their argument that the case should be transferred to Guatemala. So that case is now proceeding to trial, but that's not to say that it doesn't face many challenges. In particular, there have been public reports about major security concerns in Guatemala for those who have brought the case. The second case is against Tahoe Resources. The allegations in that case involve shooting uh, to suppress opposition to Tahoe's mine in Guatemala, along with evidence tampering by Tahoe security personnel, and an allegation that it has been the continuing policy of Tahoe to blame the victims. The men who were shot are now facing those jurisdictional obstacles uh, in Canada based on an argument by Tahoe that the case should be sent to Guatemala. In both of these cases, the chiefs of security are actually on criminal trial in Guatemala, facing criminal charges, but there's been no action against the companies. As a result, those who were affected have turned to Canada. Though the progress of the Hud Bay case uh, is an encouraging sign for affected communities, Civil litigation in Canada is far from a panacea. As I said, there have been no judgments yet. Litigation is very expensive in Canada. Those affected have to find lawyers willing to take significant risk and advance significant expenses. If they lose, those who brought the case may have to pay the legal fees for the company that they have sued, which is obviously impossible for the affected individuals. There are very few lawyers or law firms in Canada who will bring these cases against mining companies, and many of the largest law firms have mining clients and therefore won't take these cases on. Litigation is lengthy. It can take years and years in Canada. These challenges in Canadian litigation must be considered in context of the likelihood that Canadian companies may not be able to be sued in the countries where the abuses happened. This can be for reasons of corruption, a lack of political will, or jurisdictional questions. So to conclude, despite major Canadian mining presence in Latin America, there is no Canadian regulation providing remedy to the affected individuals, and so the only remedy is through costly, lengthy, and challenging litigation. I'm going to return to uh, Jennifer Moore now for a conclusion. So just to wrap up, we hope that we've helped to demonstrate, although there's a lot more that we could talk about, that through its acts and emissions, the state of Canada has dis demonstrated its support, tolerance, and conformity with mining activities and a model for mining that are causing profound harms against both individuals and communities. This is evident through its political and economic support to companies from within Canada as a result of its diplomatic activities outside of Canada and through the absence of policies and laws that would provide access to justice for people affected by Canadian Canadian mining companies, among other things. In this context, we ask the Commission to urge the Canadian government to reset its priorities based on the respect 
for the individual and collective rights of indigenous and non-indigenous communities, workers, and the environment to drop its corporate social responsibility strategy, which serves as a whitewash for continuing impunity regarding harms taking place in connection with the mining industry, and to install a legal framework that would ensure corporate and state accountability for individual and collective rights violations taking place. Furthermore, we ask you to urge the Government of Canada to end its practice of channeling diplomatic services and overseas development aid to the mining industry, to end its involvement in the decision-making over management of natural wealth in other countries, given its apparent conflicts of interest, and to establish mandatory frameworks based on respect for Indigenous and human rights for state agencies that provide financing, loans, and insurance to the industry. We understand that the Commission has undertaken some efforts to bring attention to issues related to business and human rights. We also recognize that there's a forthcoming study on extractive industry, tourism, and indigenous peoples. As part of this, we would encourage the Commission to look at the extraterritorial dimensions of these issues and the responsibility of the states of origin of the companies involved. For example, it would be valuable for the forthcoming study to include a chapter on these matters. We look forward to your questions and thank you again for your time. Thank you. Can I ask the state to respond? Thank you. Muchísimas gracias. Buenos días a todos. No, I'm going to speak in English. I just thought I'd say hello in Spanish. Um, hello. My name is Dana Kreiderman, and I am the alternate permanent representative of Canada to the Organization of American States. Uh, with me today at the table is Brett Maitland, Counselor and uh, alternate representative to the Organization of American States, and Charlotte McDowell, who is our senior development officer and alternate representative to the OAS. Um, Canada is very pleased to participate in this thematic hearing out of respect and support for the work of the Inter American Commission on Human Rights and its support for the protection of human rights in the hemisphere. Canada also welcomes the opportunity to share with the Commission our international policy framework and approach to corporate social responsibility, and in particular, our CSR framework for the Canadian international extractive sector. Canada is committed to promoting responsible business practices. The Government of Canada encourages and expects all Canadian companies working internationally to respect all applicable laws and international standards to operate transparently and in consultation with host governments and local communities to conduct their activities in a socially and environmentally responsible manner. In this regard, Canada has in place a variety of initiatives which demonstrate our long-standing commitment to supporting and promoting international CSR guidelines and standards. These initiatives are not only facilitating the commercial success of Canadian companies active abroad, but also contributing to the broad-based economic growth, both in Canada and host countries. The latter often include developing countries and emergent economies. The Government of Canada is actively working with Canadian industry, civil society, foreign governments, and local host communities, as well as other stakeholders to foster and promote responsible business practices, which ultimately support both business success and sustainable economic growth and development. At the domestic level, Canada has one of the world's strongest legal and regulatory frameworks for its, its, its extractive industries. One based on rigorous health and safety measures, environmental assessments, strong labour laws, requirements for consultation with local communities and Aboriginal groups, and regulation of activities throughout the life cycle of any extractive production facility. This robust domestic approach formed the basis for the development and announcement in 2009 of the CSR Strategy for the Canadian International Extractive Sector. I would like to emphasize that the strategy was the culmination of a long and in-depth parliamentary and public consultative process and brought together a large number of stakeholders and experts from industry, civil society and academia. The strategy is also part of a comprehensive Government of Canada CSR framework that is global and covers all industrial sector sectors. 
I will come back to Canada's CSR strategy later in this presentation. The large majority of Canadian companies, including those in the extractive sector, make considerable efforts to conduct their activities in line with international CSR standards. Many of our largest extractive sector companies have explicitly signed on to or adhere to international mechanisms, such as the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises and the voluntary principles on security and human rights. They also devote considerable resources to CSR activities, such as community engagement, both at home and abroad. The issues raised by the requesters have been the subject of considerable debate in Canada. The submission presented in the request for this hearing re refers to Canada's recognition and application of widely accepted international guidelines and standards in the area of corporate social responsibility. Canada wishes to, wishes to register that not only has the government been actively engaged in supporting and encouraging the use of a wide range of international CSR mechanisms, such as the OS OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises, the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, and the voluntary principles on security and human rights, but also that it is a world leader in that field. Canada was an original adherent to the OECD guidelines on their establishment in 1976, and we have since been a driver or a supporter of many other international CSR instruments. We remain the only country in the world with a national CSR strategy explicitly focused on operations of its extractive sector companies abroad. At the same time, it's important to note that Canada's overall commitment to CSR, including adherence to OECD guidelines, extends well beyond the extractive sector to all business activity conducted by Canadian companies abroad. As a member of the OAS, Canada has undertaken to ensure the human rights of all individuals within its territory and subject to its jurisdiction. This includes upholding the rights described in the American Declaration of the Rights and Duties of Man. Canada takes these obligations seriously. The requesters have indicated in their submission that Canada's regulatory framework and the opportunities for redress that currently exist in Canada are inconsistent with the Maastricht Principles and the United Nations Guiding Principles. The Maastricht Principles and the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights, however, cannot be relied upon to establish a novel interpretation of Canada's human rights obligations. Of fundamental importance, the Maastricht Principles are a statement by scholars of international human rights law conveying their view of how extraterritorial obligations should be interpreted. The UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights expressly state under the commentary to the second principle that at present states are not generally required under international human rights law to regulate the extraterritorial activities of businesses domiciled in their territory and or jurisdiction. The principles correctly indicate that states may breach their international human rights obligations where human rights abuses by private actors within their territory can be attributed to them or where, where they fail to take appropriate steps to prevent, investigate, punish, and redress such abuse. Neither of those circumstances exist with respect to the issues raised by the requesters today. Nevertheless, I would like to make a few points about extraterritorial obligations and Canada's position on that issue. The human rights abuses alleged by the re requesters today clearly fall outside the scope of Canada's obligations under the American Declaration. No one has alleged that Canadian company, or no one has alleged, forgive me, that Canadian state actors, whether inside or outside Canada, committed violations of Canada's obligations with respect to the rights described in the American Declaration. The connection to Canada is the fact that many mining companies at work in the region are incorporated in Canada either federally or in one of its provinces or territories. With respect to these corporations' activities outside Canada, 
The fact of their incorporation in Canada is clearly not a sufficient connection to Canada to engage Canada's obligations under the American Declaration. In addition, many of the actions proposed by the requesters in their summary of issues fall outside the scope of Canada's legal obligations and jurisdiction. It's important to note in this context that host countries in Latin America offer domestic, legal, and regulatory avenues through which the claims being referenced by the requesters can and should be addressed. It is Canada's position that these avenues for judicial redress should be exhausted before complaints are taken elsewhere. The issue of legislated access to, to the Canadian court system to address grievances associated with the alleged activities of Canadian companies abroad has been the subject by many civil society organizations in, in Canada, subject of discussion. Canada has stated its preference for voluntary mechanisms. It is a long-standing position of the Government of Canada that the pairing of international voluntary CSR guidelines standards and mechanisms with legal and regulatory proceedings is impractical, inconsistent and ultimately ineffective. Canada's experience in this area, including with respect to the activities of companies abroad, is that voluntary mechanisms that facilitate dialogue, particularly in the early stages of a dispute, can lead to mutually agreed upon outcomes, including on compensation in relatively short time frames. Generally speaking, Canadian courts have jurisdiction to hear claims in civil matters against a, against a defendant corporation where that corporation is incorporated in Canada or where a corporation has submitted to the jurisdiction of a Canadian court. However, a party, and that includes the defendant corporation, may object to the court exer exercising its jurisdiction in such matters on the basis that that dispute should be heard in another forum, for example, because of the location of evidence and witnesses. The court will then decide whether to proceed or to decline to exercise its jurisdiction. I would now like to address the issue of judicial and non-judicial grievance mechanisms, which are the centre of the issues under discussion here today. Canada maintains two non-judicial mechanisms associated with the application of international CSR guidelines and standards. These are the, national, uh, the Canadian National Contact Point, or as we call them, NCP, established under the OECD guidelines for multinational enterprises, and the Office of the Extractive Sector CSR Counselor, which was established as a key deliverable under Canada's 2009 CSR strategy. It's important to note that neither of those mechanisms has a mandate or authority to undertake investigations, to issue rulings, or to impose punitive measures or other sanctions. In particular, however, the OECD National Contact Point mechanism provides, provides an internationally recognized forum for disputing parties to discuss problematic issues arising from business activities, including extractive sector projects. For strongly disputed cases, both mechanisms can support the engagement of a professional mediator. Canada established a voluntary NCP mechanism in 2000 based on the fact that the OECD guidelines themselves are voluntary guidelines, as well as the practical considerations referenced earlier. The decision to, to establish a voluntary CSR counselor's office for the extractive sector was based on the views expressed at cross-country consultative roundtables held with a, ver a broad range of stakeholders for the development of the 2009 CSR strategy. I should also mention that there was no consensus on the creation of an extractor sector ombudsman. It remains Canada's position that the voluntary international CSR guidelines, standards and principles that we, officially, that we officially endorse do not establish a legal basis for punitive measures. The requesters have raised the issue of Canadian government support to companies operating overseas. While it is referenced only in the context of the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, this is a, broad, a much broader issue 
that touches on Canada's overall CSR policy framework and the 2009 CSR strategy for its extractive sector. The submission falsely creates the impression that Canada is ignoring the actions of Canadian companies operating, operating abroad with respect to CSR practices. This is simply not the case. The submission re references export credit agencies. In the Canadian context, this refers to Export Development Canada, or as we call it, EDC, a Canadian Crown Corporation. EDC has a long-standing commitment to CSR and to ensuring a thorough due diligence process in the area of CSR performance prior to the approval of export credit financing. EDC's corporate social responsibility commitments are underpinned by various international agreements and standards, including the International Finance Corporation performance standards on social and environmental responsibility, sustainability, excuse me. As an example, in October 2007, EDC became one of the first export credit agencies to adopt the, the Equator principles, the Ecuador principles, which are themselves based on the IFC performance standards. These mechanisms explicitly link CSR performance with the receipt and disbursement of export financing or project loans. In addition, Canada's Trade Commissioner Service, or TCF, is one of Canada's oldest governmental institutions, and it is embedded within our Department of Foreign Affairs, Trade and Development. This large network of trade officers, housed both at headquarters and within our embassies and consulates abroad, provide advice and support to Canadian companies abroad, and a mandatory component of that advice is information to help Canadian companies apply CSR practices in the jurisdiction in question. Furthermore, Canada's network of diplomatic missions actively promotes awareness and understanding of the importance of responsible business practices and human rights. They create opportunities for relationship building through conferences, workshops, and other CSR activities involving companies, host government representatives, and civil society. Canada has provided fundings for initiatives around the world to increase awareness of the importance of corporate social responsibility. A key pillar to Canada's CSR strategy is the provision of assistance to, ho to, to host developing countries, to, to help developing countries to build their extractive sector regulatory capaci capacity in recognition of the fact that host countries also have responsibilities to establish a strong regulatory framework and ensure an appropriate enabling environment to operationalize CSR standards and principles. In this regard, Canada is assisting host countries in Latin America to improve their capacity to manage their extractive sector and to ensure that the benefits derived from the extractive sector development contribute to the sustainable and equitable growth. I would like to mention a few examples of this assistance in Latin America. In Peru, Canada is providing approximately $64 million in multi-year programming that directly supports the building of natural resources governance, government's capacity. Through this programming, we are working with municipalities and civil society organizations to improve local governance, transparency, and equitable distribution of revenues deriving from extractive sector projects. Through the Andean Regional Initiative, or a ARI, we are co-financing private sector alliances to execute projects that will serve communities living near mining areas by providing vocational training, diversifying local economies, and increasing the competitiveness of small and medium-sized enterprises. The ARI totals 20 million over five years and is active in Colombia, Bolivia, and Peru. With respect to human rights in general, in Colombia, Canada is one of the largest donors to the local UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Canada's expectation is that Canadian companies should observe internationally recognized principles of responsible business conduct. It is also referenced in, and reflected in our approach to negotiating bilateral free trade agreements and foreign direct investment, uh, foreign direct protection agreements. Canada's model free trade agreements and 
Foreign Investment Protection Agreement text contains a dedicated CSR article which states that each party, can, each party to the agreement should encourage enterprises operating within their respective territories or subject to their jurisdiction to voluntarily incorporate internationally recognized CSR standards in their international policies. The requester's submission asks that Canada realign its mining programs and policies with, the international, with its international obligations to promote and respect Indigenous and human rights, including free, prior and informed community consent. Canada is of the view that our CSR program and policy initiatives, some of which I've mentioned here today, are very much in line with our international obligations and furthermore, set a positive example for many of the countries in which we work. As noted earlier in my presentation, it is only in limited circumstances that Canada's legal and regulatory framework would apply to the activities of Canadian companies in other countries. I would like to emphasize that Canada does already have in place a comprehensive CSR framework, including a strategy aimed specifically at our international extractive sector. In addition, Canada's overall corporate social responsibility approach is global. It covers all sectors of business activity, recognizes the majority of international uh, CSR mechanisms, and extensively covers CSR issues such as human rights and business, conflict minerals, and anti-corruption measures. Canada has also recently led or co-sponsored the inclusion of texts promoting corporate social responsibility in a number of resolutions of the OAS General Assembly. The Government of Canada understands that responsible business practices by Canadian companies operating abroad not only enhances their chances for business success, but can also contribute to the broad-based economic and social benefits for the countries in which we operate. This is why we so resolutely promote international CSR guidelines and standards, and why so many Canadian companies adhere to them. CSR is of importance to the Canadian government and to the people of Canada. While there always remains work to be done, we would ask the, the Commission to take note of the significant commitment shown by Canada to the wide range of international CSR guidelines and mechanisms, as well as specific initiatives undertaken by the government to support, promote, and encourage the application of these mechanisms by Canadian companies operating overseas. Canada is confident that our extractive sector companies are not only world leaders in the application of CSR guidelines and standards, but also that they contribute significantly to the long-term sustainable economic development of the host countries in which they operate. Thank you, and I would be pleased to entertain questions. Uh, thank you very much. I will now ask uh, Commissioner Vanuki uh, to make his observations. Gracias, Comisionada Rosmarie. También agradezco a las informaciones aportadas por los peticionarios por el Estado. Este es uno de aquellos casos en que las distintas visiones del problema están muy alejadas, un poquito difícil. Es distinto de otras audiencias en que se ubica con claridad que hay problemas y el Estado tiene sus dificultades para trabajar. Aquí, si fuera un caso de una, de una petición concreta, ¿cuál sería el camino para una solución amistosa? Uh, y mi pregunta a, a los peticionarios es cómo está la cuestión en el ámbito de la prensa, de la sociedad civil de Canadá. Si ese es un tema que es discutido, que hay debates, si la universidad trabaja la cuestión. Y mi pregunta a los representantes del Estado, y 
la CIDH, el Sistema de Derechos Humanos de la OEA, cuando trabaja las cuestiones de Canadá, eh, siempre busca apoyarse en artículos de la Carta de la Organización de los Estados Americanos, y aquí leyendo los artículos 35 y 36, los Estados miembros deben abstenerse de ejercer políticas, acciones o medidas que tengan serios efectos adversos sobre el desarrollo de otros Estados miembros. El artículo 36, las empresas transnacionales y la inversión privada extranjera están sometidas a la legislación y a la jurisdicción de los tribunales nacionales competentes de los países receptores y a los tratados y convenios internacionales en los cuales estos sean parte y además deben ajustarse a la política de desarrollo de los países receptores. Y aquí es un punto que los peticionarios habían uh, focalizado como el problema de la subordinación solo a tribunales de Canadá. Y una pregunta también especial, ¿cómo es el trabajo de, del Estado de Canadá con los temas del Global Compact, Business and Human Rights Guidelines, John Ruggie Guidelines, ideas como la de la búsqueda de un posible, eh, la creación de un posible, una figura de un ombudsman que trabajara esta intermediación entre las autoridades de Estado y las empresas privadas en la búsqueda de alguna solución para enfrentar los problemas. Gracias. Gracias, Presidenta. También expreso mi agradecimiento a la digna representación de las organizaciones peticionarias y a la digna delegación del ilustre Estado de Canadá por su participación en esta audiencia y ante tan importante tema para la Comisión Interamericana. Eh, yo le consultaría a ambas partes, permítanme la expresión así, organizaciones peticionarias y, y a la delegación del Estado. Eh, si dentro de la legislación nacional eh, del Canadá eh, eh, se contempla como requisito para que el gobierno contribuya financieramente eh, con alguna empresa, que existan eh, garantías o controles de que el impacto de sus proyectos eh, no afecten derechos humanos. Eh, 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 como ocurre en algunos países. Eh, también si jurídicamente es viable que eh, eh, en el Estado exigir algún tipo de responsabilidad a empresas canadienses por el impacto que tengan sus labores o sus filiales en los derechos humanos de las personas en el extranjero. Y finalmente le consultaría particularmente a, a las organizaciones peticionarias, eh, como si conocen precedentes de cortes nacionales o internacionales eh, que hayan eh, eh, declarado, establecido la responsabilidad de las empresas eh, matrices o a los propios estados tratándose de un de un tribunal internacional a, a los estados de origen de tales empresas por el impacto que tengan sus proyectos en los derechos de las personas en el extranjero. Muchas gracias por, esta, por su participación y estaremos muy atentos a recibir alguna información complementaria que se sirvan brindar. Muchas gracias, Presidente. Uh, Muchas gracias. Eh, muy, muy buenas tardes. Eh, agradecemos la presencia de las dos delegaciones. Eh, 
de, del Estado y de los, de los peticionarios. Eh, me gustaría, si nos pudieran comp compartir, si, si en Canadá hay alguna mesa de trabajo conjunta, si experiencias de diálogo como las que ustedes están presentando con el gobierno, hay mecanismos de diálogo, de seguimiento, de monitoreo entre universidades y actores de sociedad civil y el gobierno. Si es el caso, ¿cuál es el, el resultado de esos procesos de diálogo? Eh, ¿Qué consecuencias positivas ven ustedes? ¿Qué buenas prácticas pudieran compartir con otros gobiernos, si es el caso? ¿O qué eh, espacios de colaboración ven ustedes de la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos en esas iniciativas? Si es que eso existe, le, les pediría a ambas delegaciones que lo pudieran poner en la mesa. Creo que sería muy interesante conocer la, la evolución de la reflexión que existe en Canadá sobre esta temática. Y la segunda, como hoy el comisionado Anuki dice, eh, el, el, la aproximación jurídica interamericana hacia Canadá es a partir de la carta de la OEA y de la Declaración Americana, que tiene algunas evoluciones sobre estos principios justamente. Eh, ¿cómo, ¿Cómo ve el gobierno de Canadá el entendimiento de lo que el, el comisionado Banuki ha puesto en la mesa? Entendemos y sabemos que hay una responsabilidad de los países de destino. Y eso se, se dijo en la intervención. Pero a la luz de lo que dice la carta, ¿cómo, cómo interpreta el Estado esos marcos jurídicos? Y, y también eh, si existieran acciones de parte de, del Estado canadiense en términos de concertación con otros estados. Eh, sabemos porque algunos actores de la sociedad civil han reflejado algunas preocupaciones en materia de la cooperación canadiense. En, en la región. Si ustedes tuvieran que ver eh, o decirnos algo, porque no solo es el tema, entiendo, de lo que se ha mencionado de, las, de la industria minera, sino se hicieron ejemplos de embajadas y de actores diplomáticos que son actores gubernamentales. Eh, si ustedes pudieran comentar eh, cuáles son las directrices de intervención de las eh, embajadas o consulados canadienses, tengo entendido que es un tema que se puso en la mesa y quisiéramos eh, escuchar del Estado algo en particular. Muchas gracias. Uh, thank you. Uh, as rapporteur for indigenous peoples and in fact rapporteur for Canada, um, I have a special interest in this subject. I believe the, our attention was brought last year when I was heading the Economic, Social and Cultural Rights Unit. One of the petitioners raised this issue and is something I have been working with to get more information from civil society and from the state and give us the opportunity to air what are really very important issues before the commission. And I'm really very pleased that you have accepted the invitation to, to come and, and really discuss these core issues. Um, as someone mentioned, there is a report. The report uh, is from um, my repetition Repetition on Indigenous Peoples. Uh, we are inquiring into exploitation of natural resources, so it's a bit broader than simply extractive industries. And we've already determined that one chapter will, in fact, be on this very ticklish issue of extraterritoriality, because, as I've said, it's something which has been very important to me personally, as, um, and we've had tried to have more hearings on it. So, and I think, f for me, the... The reason is because despite the assurances of um, Canada that there is good policy, we continue at the Commission to see a number of very, very serious human rights uh, violations occurring uh, in the region um, as a result of certain countries, and Canada being one of the main ones, um, the companies from certain countries, and we're talking here about the right to life, people are being killed, vulnerable peoples, in particular indigenous peoples, and also persons of African descent in some of the countries. Loss of livelihood, displacement of land and property, environmental rights, right to health, where there's population, rights to water, basic rights equality and non-discrimination, criminalization of human rights defense, which my colleague who's rapporteur of human rights defenders knows a lot about, uh, certainly indigenous rights, including consultative rights uh, and community property. So we are seeing the deficiencies of the policy. So of, of whatever policy Canada and other states like that have, and you certainly have policy like the CSR, but we see the cracks in the policy. We are the other end of it. 
Um, so really the human face. So I certainly believe, and I'm aware that there have been isolated instances in another life, like in financial law, I have seen where the courts have attempted to reach extraterritorially in relation to human rights. Uh, but I certainly believe, and my own personal belief, this is not the belief of the commission, but to put forward this view and something we need to interrogate, that international human rights uh, must be able, I think, to transcend borders and to transcend what are really very legalistic um, ideas of extraterritorial jurisdiction. And I think it must be a core principle in a, a democratic state, especially one which is concerned about human rights. So one hopes that a state, an enlightened state, might I add, like Canada, can take leadership on this issue and, and find a way. But we recognize that it's a difficult um, issue. But I would like to ask whether in spite of this policy, CSR, whether Canada is really aware of those companies, and I'm talking about details here, that breach the, their own policy, their own CSR policy. Do you have data, for example? Do you have a monitoring mechanism? Uh, do you have uh, collaborations and communication with civil society which can feed into data? Or is it just a nice policy that you have laid out? I think collaboration with civil society is key in this issue uh, because I think Canada today and before has acknowledged that they, uh, that they wish to be responsible and they wish to respect human rights. So is it simply a question, as you mentioned, in terms of support for host countries? Is it simply a question of giving information advice or do you have um, proactive mechanisms and enforcement uh, strategies and monetary strategies? That for me would be key to, in talk, uh, to talk about uh, uh, accountability in relation to the policy. But going beyond the policy, I've, I found it, the, 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 the response a little, on the one hand, Canada says, yes, we are responsible and we wish to promote human rights, and we are. But on the other hand, a hands-off approach. We take no responsibility. Uh, this is all to do with the other state. Let them. So I'm, I'm a little concerned. I understand the legal argument. And as I said before, we have to move beyond the legalistic if we are really concerned about human rights. So for me, the, po the core point is that what the petitioners are saying and what we intend to interrogate further is that private companies are de facto agents of the state. I think that's where we are. Can they be seen as de facto agents? And I think that's a serious issue. I would like to see that. Um, I would, of course, look with great interest at what happens in the courts. But even beyond that, I would wish to urge Canada to, to take these issues seriously and uh, go beyond the, the the sort of the mere legalistic at this point and try to construct because there are real issues of human rights violations at stake. And of course, we welcome more information from the petitioners in relation to the kinds of remedies you envisage and more concrete examples of the violations. Thank you. Um, we can have some more time, five minutes each from the, each side to respond. Thank you very much, uh, Madam President. Um, so uh, the, uh, I, I'm first going to talk about the CSR policy as well. And we heard, uh, you know, I appreciate your explaining the, the, the good things that Canada's doing. Uh, but uh, if we go back to our example of the highways, uh, uh, Canada is helping build roads and uh, creating great highways. There's still no law that guides. And the, uh, I said, well, it's, it's on the honor system. If there's an accident, what happens if you can't sue? Well, that's exactly what we saw in one of the two <laughs> Uh, in fact, the, 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 the Corporate Social Responsibility Council, which is the, the, it was sort of the main thing that the Canada said that they were going to do. They were going to hear complaints, and this person was going to mediate. And then the companies withdrew, and that was it. So that is, imagine if we were on a highway and you got hit by a car, and that was what you had to deal with. Um, so I'm now going to, uh, uh, it, it, it does go to the core of this. The uh, uh, profits do not respect borders. We're getting profits in Canada, but if it's a human rights violation, and we saw this in the case of Blackfire. Oh, well, that's their problem. It's not our problem. Hud Bay Minerals, they have a very thick 30-page, 50-page publication every year about 
how much CSR they do. They are wonderful citizens. They're committed to the community. When it came to court and these women who were raped and this guy, the widow of the man who was killed went to court in Canada, you know what the headquarters in, it said? No duty of care. It has nothing to do with us, okay? 50-page CSR report, we're really committed to the community, nothing to do with us. Even if, so the legal position is even if those rapes happened, if, you, if the security agents raped those women, even if the murder happened with the guy, you know, the, the head of security, that's not, has nothing to do with headquarters of Hud Bay. Okay, so now that is the problem. So I'm now going to uh, pass it on to my colleague who will talk about, I think, a very important uh, issue that was raised about extraterritorial, extraterritoriality. Thank you. I'd, I'd like to respond certainly to the comments of the, of the president as well as uh, try to give a very brief answer to Commissioner Orozco Enriquez that we can expand on uh, further. With regard to the point of extraterritoriality, um, what you're seeing in litigation and civil lawsuits in Canada is that they are there not just because these companies are merely incorporated in Canada. These cases specifically allege acts and omissions and decisions made in Canada by Canadian officers and boards of directors. So these, these actually are not extraterritorial cases. These are not matters of things that merely happen in other countries, in Guatemala, for example, and, uh, and, and simply uh, relate to Canada through incorporation. These cases also specifically detail the corporate social responsibility policies that these companies signed on to and then allegedly violated after. Um, in, in regards to the question from uh, Commissioner Orozco, yes, there are some precedents. There are not a lot of precedents around the world, but it is a growing area. Uh, in Europe, there has been some legislation enacted, and we'd be happy to provide further information on that. The United States, you may be aware, has a longer history uh, under what's called the Alien Tort Statute of litigation against parent companies. That has now gone through some changes due to a recent Supreme Court decision. However, these are examples where other countries are facing this issue and looking at it uh, through the court system in addition to other types of regulation, and we'll be happy to provide further details. Thank you. Jen? Yes. Um, I want to respond to some of the questions that dealt with uh, civil society and attempts to resolve these issues. Um, after the Parliamentary Commission made its recommendations for legal norms to be instituted in Canada in 2005, Canadian civil society organizations formed the Canadian ne Network for Corporate Accountability and entered into two years of roundtable processes and concerted uh, conversations with industry and government to come up with a consensual report that the government then waited two years to respond to and then instituted CSR strategy which failed to implement the recommendations even of that report. Um, there was also civil society me members that participated in a center for excellence that was set up as part of the government's CSR strategy, uh, sp supposedly to deal with good practices for the industry and to discuss what, what those standards should be. The government is now not funding that center for excellence. It's turned into another industry-sponsored CSR mechanism that doesn't work. Um, and also, at the same time that the Canadian government is channeling more money to more public relations for Canadian mining companies overseas through these uh, CSR projects is defunding organizations in Canada that have been talking that have been calling for corporate accountability and state accountability and um, and I also just want to pick up on um, the the state's comment about uh, it being uh, necessary for for embassies to to encourage these CSR policies when we did the research on uh, with with our partner organizations around the black fire case we found no evidence that the trade commissioner did anything to encourage Blackfire uh, to abide by any sorts of standards. There was no obligations on that company. And there was no evidence in, in any of the documentation. We saw a 1,000 pages of documentation um, between 
state, uh, the embassy and the company and, and other, other members. The only thing they had was the CSR task force set up at the Mining Chamber of Commerce for them to facilitate conversations. And it's not evident that Blackfire went or even needed to attend. In fact, I really think that what's going on through the embassies is, is facilitating the kind of arrogant and self-entitled type of behavior that we see on the part of Canadian mining companies throughout the region. And, and it would be with, would be very interested to share further examples with you and also just to highlight that um, the way in which Canada is, is using its overseas development aid, it is using its development aid also to interfere in the mining policies of other countries and recently used that aid to uh, provide technical support to a mi new mining law in Honduras in the post-military coup context at a time when it is the most violent time for you, somebody to be a human rights or an environmental defender and lifted a seven-year moratorium on new mining projects that is putting people's lives at risk. Um, so, so I think there's real questions and much more questions to, to continue to be asked of what's going on with the Canadian state and the rules that it can impose on itself as well as um, imposing on Canadian corporations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Just to uh, wrap up, I just uh, uh, we encourage the uh, commission to g take these uh, uh, matters into account, not only in the study that uh, uh, you're, you're doing with the indigenous people, but uh, throughout the uh, uh, I think system, because it is a, it's a, it's a burning issue. Uh, the United Nations, as I already said, has has already addressed this directly to Canada, and I think it just would be wonderful to see the commission take the same steps. Thank you. Uh, may I ask the state to uh, give a few more minutes, yes. Thank you very much. Um, I think there's there's been a lot of issues raised at this discussion today, probably too many to respond to in, in the time allotted. Um, but I, I think just to, to emphasize the point that this is a very important issue for Canada. It's one that we take very seriously. We do foster and support dialogue on this. We do uh, support CSR initiatives all around the world. It's, it's very important to us. What I'd like to suggest is that we've taken account of your questions and we'd like to provide a much more comprehensive uh, response in writing if that is acceptable to the Commission. Yes, of course. The Commission always welcomes uh, information in writing. In fact, in this case, I think we might actually prefer it, especially because we're doing a report. So we would encourage you very strongly to give us a response. And that goes for both petitioners and um, the state. You know, we welcome continuing information and in any form, whether it's an email, please keep in touch with us. I think we all agree that this is an important issue. I'm really happy that the state is conducive to further dialogue and I'm really positive that we can, you know, work towards a better resolution of this issue of human rights. Thank you again uh, to the State of Canada for your attendance and the respectful dialogue and also for the petitioners in uh, bringing this information and hearing to us and a good day.